introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Richard Olmsted, the incoming president of the the incoming president of the Botanical Society of America. Dick has received many honors throughout his career, including being elected as a distinguished fellow of the Botanical Society of America, our highest honor. Dick received his PhD from the University of Washington, where he worked with Melinda Denton. And he did a postdoc at Indiana University, working with Dr. Jeffrey Palmer. In 1991, Dick joined the faculty of the, of the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, along with uh, me and uh, Pam Diggle at the same time. Uh, and then in 1996, he moved to the University of Washington, where he's been ever since. And currently, he's a professor and curator. Um, Dick has also served as the president of the American Society of Plant Taxonomists and the International Society of Phylogenetic Nomenclature. He has trained numerous students, undergraduates and graduate students. He's trained 15 PhD students and a number of postdocs. Um, Dick has had a highly productive research career and will continue to do so, I'm sure, for a long time. Um, he has about 200 peer-reviewed publications. He's been awarded numerous uh, research grants from the National Science Foundation and various other sources. Scientifically, I suppose, uh, Dick is most known for his work on the systematics of Scutellaria in the Lamiaceae and the molecular systematics of the Boraginales, Lamiales, Solanales, and other Asteridae. And Dick is just a really good colleague. So please welcome Dick Olmsted. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I can't uh, blame the empty seats on competition with other talks, so uh, I'll just uh, be happy that as many people did decide to come as did. Um, Tom uh, pointed out that um, he and Pam and I all started our faculty careers at the University of Colorado in the same year. What he didn't say, and some of you may have recognized, is that we have all been successive presidents of the Botanical Society of America. So I think that was a really good cohort that Colorado hired that year. Um, we've all gone to different positions since then, but we all remember that time fondly, I'm sure. Some of you have probably been uh, watching the slides as they go by. I'm about to turn this off as I enter my talk. But uh, a few weeks ago, all of you received an email from the Botanical Society. Some of you may not have. Uh, read it, but it asked you to fill out a survey uh, about your uh, participation in international uh, research, cooperations of various source, education, and so on. And that's going to form uh, the basis for much of my talk tonight. So I want to thank all of you in advance who did uh, participate. Over 200 members responded. I also asked for uh, photographs and anecdotes about your experiences in, in international uh, uh, projects, and those are the photos that have been uh, showing as you came in. Okay, uh, the title of my talk is The International Botanist. And when uh, I was uh, elected last year as president-elect, uh, I think it was probably Bill Dahl who said, well, you know, uh, presidents are all asked to um, uh, have some sort of a theme for their presidency. And uh, I was a little taken aback by that because I didn't realize I was expected to actually do something as president. But. Uh, <laughs> But I, I did give it some thought, and I realized that one of the things that I think has had the greatest impact on my career has been the interactions I've had uh, with people and places around the world. Not 
uh, in the U.S., which is my home and my, where my home institution is, but uh, also in many other places around the world. So what I want to do tonight is uh, start off with some anecdotes about, from my own personal career, but then go through the results of the, the survey that you guys uh, helped with. So there, there actually will be some data slides in my talk, not original research that no one has seen before. So uh, let's get underway. Machu Picchu. How many people have been to Machu Picchu? I'm glad to see so many hands. It's really one of the most fabulous places on earth. This is a picture taken in 2009 when I was there in the rainy season. I'd actually been there 41 years before as an exchange student when I was a, in Peru in 1968 at age 17. Uh, it had changed a lot in those 41 years. I'm not going to go into that here, but the rainy season is an interesting time to go there because there aren't so many tourists. And sometimes there isn't even an operating rail line to get you there, which is how most of the tourists get there. I, I and my uh, postdoc, Nancy Refugio, did manage to make it there, but we had to go on a, one of these little microbuses that leads you around through the mountains, and the, even the road had washed out. Hours before, this road was impassable, and, and there was about a 500 or 1,000 foot drop off to the right. The driver of the minibus said, everyone has to get out because uh, he didn't want us all to die if the truck went off the edge. <laughs> um, but the reason I'm starting with this is um, to relate an anecdote of something that was sort of an epiphany on a late night, in the, a long rainy night drive back from Machu Picchu to Cusco in a crowded minibus, uh, sitting next to a woman from Britain whom I uh, had a chance to talk to for several hours on the way back. An epiphany, you know, I just realized, I don't think I'd ever had an epiphany before. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> At any rate, the, the epiphany that I had that night that she facilitated was this woman was somebody who worked as an accountant in the UK. And she said she worked as an accountant because it was a job she could leave at the drop of a hat and not worry about and come back and find another job doing that. And she would travel all over the world working, at, in this case, she had been working for six months in a hostel in the mountains in Peru and then taking some time to travel. But the epiphany was her explanation about why international travel is so important. She said, I never feel the same about any place I go after I get back. And the way I feel about every place I've been is qualitatively different about how I feel about any place I have not been. And that is that I always, my ears perk up, I always listen, I'm always aware when I hear something or learn something about a place I've been. But if it's a place I haven't been, those news items, those notes sort of pass by. And it really is true that the experience of being someplace uh, has a profound effect on one's person and one's uh, uh, development, whether you realize it at the time or not. Well, on that particular trip, my reason to go there was not to be a tourist at Machu Picchu, although we did spend a couple days doing that. It was to collect plants as part of a project on the family Verbenaceae that I've been involved with for many years. I'm collecting plants on the lower right, but along with us on that trip was Segundo Leva. And how many people have been in the field with Segundo? Quite a number of hands. I'm actually sort of surprised there's not more. Probably every foreign botanist over the last 10 years who's spent time in Peru collecting plants, or just about everyone, has met or been in the field with Segundo Leva. He's one of the most fabulous field botanists you could imagine, and will go at the drop of the hat uh, to collect plants with you. And in the upper right is my postdoc, Nancy Refilio, who herself is from Lima. She did her PhD in the US at Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Gardens and a postdoc with me. The Yama is an interloper. I didn't get its name. But Peru wasn't the only place where uh, travels to collect Verbenaceae took me and my students. Uh, in the upper right is uh, Brazil with uh, Pat Lou Irving on the right, Veronica Thode, a graduate student from Rio Grande do Sul who spent time in my lab as did Pat in her lab, and Fatima Salamina. On the upper right, we traveled to the Republic of Texas. Uh, <laughs> Pat again and uh, Yuan Yawu. More about Yuan in a moment. Pat went to South Africa, and the lower are a couple of pictures of uh, me in 
Argentina with, uh, uh, on the lower right with Natalie O'Leary, who did her PhD on verbena, verbena and relatives. Uh, and in the middle, uh, Laura Frost, who's here in the audience tonight, a current graduate student working on Scytherexlum in Columbia at the University of the Andes. All of these places uh, left indelible stamps, as well as uh, providing uh, the opportunity for research, which of course was the, the reason why I was there in the first place. Out of that collaboration, uh, we've had field trips to a variety of different places, cooperating with botanists in every one of them. Um, collaboration among 18 scientists from five different countries, formal uh, co-authorship on papers, PhD degrees, for as part of this project to five students, current or finished, uh, including uh, some in Argentina and Brazil, student exchanges, uh, presentations at international conferences, and more ways than I can count how this has changed my life, and I'm sure everyone else who has been involved with it. My second case study, or personal anecdote, involves a international exchange program I was involved with helping to set up and, and uh, implement for the first few years of its life, an undergraduate exchange program with Szechuan University, between Szechuan University and the University of Washington. This was uh, initiated in the year 2000. We, uh, the first class of students uh, exchanging between the two institutions was in 2002. Uh, you can see the banner in the upper right and in Chengdu at the university welcoming the American students when we went over and a couple of other pictures of people who were involved with this. The subject of this was the environmental sciences, and it was broadly defined to be botany and ecology and uh, cultural anthropology and archaeology, and uh, students in all of those fields that participated in the exchange. You might recognize this one. She's in the audience, too. This is Rachel Meyer. Rachel uh, was an, probably a junior in college when this picture was taken in a rural town in southern Sichuan where uh, we spent some time uh, living and uh, studying with uh, an uh, ethnic minority group in this part of China. Um, I and some of the students participated in uh, doing a local flora for the village. We prepared herbarium specimens that now are in the school there for the people to study. We also worked on it and Rachel was involved with uh, an ethnobotanical study of the plants that the local people used. And um, I think it's not an exaggeration to say, and in fact, Rachel has confirmed this, uh, that this experience set her on the path that she's on today. She's gone on to do a PhD at um, the New York Botanic Gardens with Amy Litt, uh, postdoc now at New York University, uh, she's worked on the domestication of eggplant for a PhD. She's working on the domestication of African rice now. Um, she was a uh, student board member in the BSA. Uh, and at the time, although we just learned, no longer, the youngest member of the BSA Legacy Society. So, uh, <laughs> Rachel. You know, if that was the outcome of that year's exchange program that involved 60 students, 30 from the US and 30 from China, it would have been, in my mind, uh, a rousing success. But there's someone else I want to point out, circle in red and then in the picture on the right, Yuan Yawu. Yuan was one of the students in the Chinese cohort. He was 18 years old at the time. Uh, he came to the US that year and spent the year doing research in my lab. One of the most impressive intellects and a young man that I've ever uh, encountered. I encouraged him to come back to do his PhD, which he did. Of that first cohort of students in that China exchange, he was the youngest to go on to complete his PhD. Uh, two postdocs later, he is now uh, assistant professor at the University of Connecticut. Um, two years ago in New Orleans, he was invited to speak in our past president symposium. So. Uh, BSA and this exchange program have been influential in UN's career. And again, contact in an international educational exchange program at an early stage set him off on a career that would have been unavailable to him otherwise. We followed up on this with a graduate exchange program, also involving Sichuan University, uh, funded by an NSF IGERT. Um, we had about 30 
uh, graduate students from the University of Washington who participated in this, every one of them was supported to spend a year, up to a year abroad doing research in a lab in a foreign country. And the whole basis for this was the uh, intent on our part, the PIs, that graduate students should, before they're through with their PhD, understand that international collaboration is a regular and normal part of doing science, not something that you see other people doing or that you aspire to do or that uh, only um, you know, senior scientists can do. We also uh, conducted a couple of, um, three years actually, of uh, interdisciplinary and international exchange programs to Zhuzhai Go uh, National Park in northern Sichuan. This is a UNESCO biosphere preserve and one of the most fabulous um, places on earth to view temperate flora, uh, where we established a, uh, in the picture on the lower right, the um, Zhuzhai Go uh, environment, I can't read it, such small print on here, but it's the uh, laboratory in environmental, uh, ecological, and sustainable sciences uh, a collaboration between Sichuan University, the University of Washington, and Zhuzhai Go National Park. Well, that China exchange, uh, we've now had over 500 UW and Sichuan University students who've gone through it, and we had over 30 PhD students in the course of that IGERT. Sadly, like so many IGERTs, once the funding failed or was uh, over, there was no resources to keep it going, but it did influence a lot of the students who participated in that. Well, now let's move on to our BSA member survey. Um, we actually constructed three surveys with uh, Hesker Kakaninden, Heather Kakaninden's help. We had one for USA members, members who live or work in the US, um, uh, professional members, another one for student members, and a third one for members who are from foreign institutions and live in foreign countries. And you can see the number of participants who responded. Before I go into the survey results, though, um, let me tell you a little bit about what our membership looks like. Some of you may understand that we are quite an international organization already, but many of you may not. A full 70 or 27 percent of our membership are from people outside of the USA. Now, we're outside of the USA today, of course, um, but uh, and we may often think of our Canadian colleagues as uh, more or less our, uh, our neighbors, but if you look at how this is distributed, if you add the Canadians, that brings us up to 77% of our membership is North American, but uh, the rest of the distribution comes from Europe, 9%, Asia, 6%, South America, 3%, Australia, Pacific Islands, 2%, Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean, 2%, and Africa, 1%. Um, I think it's great that we have members from all over the country, but one of the pitches I would like to make to you all as the society is that we can be we can do better. We can have more international participation and more international membership. Uh, and I hope that that's something uh, I can help uh, implement during the coming year. Well, let's look at, take a look at some of the ways that international collaboration uh, uh, can, be, uh, can be understood. Perhaps the way that comes out across most is the, through research collaboration and other international cooperative ventures. When that email went out, which I think was at, you know, like 8 o'clock in the morning St. Louis time in, uh, three weeks ago or something like that. By 8.05, I had a response from Peter Raven <laughs> with the photo on the upper right of the Floor of China uh, editorial committee taken at a location in China and saying, you know, congratulations, and here's my contribution to your slideshow. Uh, but I had many other people uh, send in, uh, slides. Doug Soltis in the lower left, this is, I think, from his international uh, NSF grant um, that he and Pam and others are involved with. And then just a lot of photos of wild and crazy graduate students traveling in the field. The first of the uh, survey questions that I want to talk about, though, uh, was the one that I, I had to bond bound the time on this a little bit. So I said 2012 to present. So that's about three and a half years. During that time, how many times have you traveled to a foreign country for research purposes? And I was uh, tickled to see that the results here showed that over 70% of our members who responded had been involved in international 
travel for research purposes over the last three years. And I think that's great. I should make as a caveat that this, of course, is not a scientific sample. I was pleased that we got as many responses as we did. But uh, since the survey went out under the title uh, Survey on International Collaboration, I worry a little bit that members who had not been involved in international collaboration felt it was not uh, you know, for them to respond. But we did get plenty of respondents who represent the broad range, I think, of our society's interests. Um, a follow-up to that was in reference to that previous question, what percentage of those trips involve collaboration with host country scientists versus going abroad for research but not actually being involved with collaboration? And I was pleased to see that uh, over 70% of those trips involve collaboration, formal collaboration in one way or another. Um, we want, we, when I say we, I'm talking about the, the US members. There are probably, hopefully, some uh, foreign members here in the audience. Um, you know, we should be involving host country scientists in our research when we travel. You know, they are essential for what we do, and um, it, they should, they have a lot to contribute. Uh, looking at graduate students' responses to their question, which was, during your time as a graduate student, have you traveled to a foreign country for a research visit? I was really tickled to see that nearly 60% of our graduate students who responded have uh, been abroad to be involved with research. If you look at the foreign respondents during that time period, um, that it was something like 33% or so of the members had traveled to the U.S. So the question here was explicitly, have you traveled to the U.S. to be involved with research? Something about how the uh, questionnaire was worded that ended up saying no now instead of no under the other respondents. But um, it would be nice if we could arrange for our foreign collaborators to uh, travel to the U.S. to do research as well. Well, ways in which research collaboration can and should be done, in my estimation, involve uh, you know, things that, that perhaps the society can help with or that uh, issues that we may confront involve finding research collaborators. Uh, this is something that's sometimes hard to do if you're uh, uh, interested in travel and, and research. But building networks to address questions of common interest, this is something where the foreign scientists often have a lot to contribute. Negotiating legal and cultural barriers. Anyone here who has traveled to collect plants in foreign countries has encountered this. I mean, this is, uh, this is almost prohibitive in some cases, and I think it has biased how research abroad is done in many cases. And uh, there is no um, substitute for having in-country collaborators when it comes to uh, negotiating the, the issues that we confront. And just maximizing our research capacity uh, and making it the most productive it can be for all partners uh, by having our host country collaborators involved. Okay, now here's where the rubber meets the road. When we do research, the metrics that are used to uh, uh, show success in research usually are publications. So I was interested in seeing how many people, how many of our members uh, have co-authored publications with uh, foreign uh, scientists outside of the USA and was pleased to see the results. It was over 75% uh, have, in the last three and a half years, uh, co-authored papers with uh, scientists outside of the US. Well, um, if you then look at the response from the foreign members, it's, um, it was also gratifying to see that more than half had, but really the fact that uh, something like 45% have not means that uh, I think we, we as the uh, North American members, uh, can do better at involving and engaging our colleagues in foreign countries uh, in that most important uh, element of the research endeavor, which is publication and communication of our results. Well, back to the Verbin AC project that I told you about before. Yuan Yawu, who I mentioned, uh, I met in China in 2002, came and did a PhD in my lab, and he was the first to get some publications out on this Verbin AC project. 
uh, in 2008, looking at the Verbena complex, but our uh, Argentine collaborators, um, we invited them to follow up on an expanded study, and they took the lead on this one. Um, the next paper that came out, or one of the next, was a family-wide phylogeny, and I should point out that the first author on this was an undergraduate who is probably also in the audience, Hannah Marks. Hannah was a BSA uh, young botanist as an undergraduate when she was at the University of Washington, um, and took the lead on this project as an undergraduate. And I think she stayed on and worked as a tech for a while after she graduated. But I also invited the Argentines to do the follow-on paper in which we examined morphology in light of that uh, phylogeny. And I want to relate a second epiphany here. Natalie O'Leary, who is the Argentine student who did her PhD on verbena and was a graduate student when I started this project, is now a independent researcher for CONICE at the Instituto Botanica Darwinion in Buenos Aires. When we invited her to be co-authors on that first paper in 2010, I have never received such a heartfelt thanks from anybody for the simple um, offer of being a co-author on a paper. She said, I don't think I ever would have felt that I could be an author on a paper in the American Journal of Botany, a journal that they hold in very high esteem in many places around the world, in which they view as being a mark of uh, high quality research. And they were uh, tickled to be co-authors on that first paper. And when I encouraged them to take the lead on the second paper, they were ready and able and did a great job. I should also make a pitch for our society-driven journals Almost all of the papers that have been published out of this project have been published in society-run journals, American Journal of Botany, Systematic Botany, and others. Well, the next area I want to talk about is uh, education and training. Um, there's a lot of different ways this can come about. The, uh, the exchange program that I talked about earlier, uh, uh, attending foreign conferences, Pat Lou Irving in the upper right talking at the last IBC, Audrey Ragsack in the audience, another graduate student in my lab, spent six months in Brazil on an NSF-funded GROW supplement to her uh, research fellowship. GROW stands for Graduate Research Opportunities Worldwide, and it's a new program at NSF for graduate students that have research fellowships. If you don't know about it, learn about it, because at this early stage in its program, almost everybody who applies gets one of these, and it will support you to spend up to a year abroad studying, doing, re doing research in a collaborator's lab uh, in a participating country, and there are many. Hannah, whom I mentioned before, spent a year in France uh, on a GROW felt, uh, supplement. Well, back to the survey, I also asked, how many times have you traveled to a foreign country to attend a conference or give a seminar in a foreign institution? And something like 75% um, of respondents uh, said that they had in the last three and a half years. That's great. Um, graduate students, almost 50% of our students, between 40 and 50%, had during some time during their graduate career. And I was very impressed with this. I think we're doing a great job of getting our graduate students involved in this sort of activity. Many students were supported to go to the last IBC by funds contributed by the BSA and ASPT and supplemented with an NSF grant. And we're looking forward to doing that again for the next IBC in 2017. The foreign respondents, and I asked if they had traveled to the USA to attend a conference, uh, more than half of them had as well. So I'm pleased to see that our foreign uh, members are participating overseas. Well, education and training, you know, there are many ways that this can be manifest. Um, it can be through lab to uh, lab student exchanges. It can be through uh, agency or foundation funded opportunities. It can be through courses and workshops and international conferences such as the upcoming IBC. The next um, a question pertains to one of those is that have you participated or someone in your lab participated in a uh, research exchange with a foreign country? And an incredible number of people had, over 60%. I was really pleased. To see. This was asked of senior or professional members. Uh, so it didn't necessarily mean them, but somebody in their lab group. And so this shows that this is something that people are participating in. Um, 
When asked of students, though, a relatively smaller proportion had. Only about 10% of our students had actually been abroad to participate in some sort of an exchange program. Um, asked of the foreign members, um, approximately half had uh, been to the U.S. to participate in some sort of an exchange. I was pleased to see that. We don't just do educational and research exchanges, though. Uh, one of our members has uh, done a really exciting job, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with Chris Martin's Plants Are Cool 2 videos. Uh, one of them, at least, has involved uh, international members. This is the Chihuahuan Desert one with Mike Moore and Chris in the middle and Helga Ochaterena on the right. And I'm not sure I remember who the person is on the left. Here's an interesting question that I asked of our graduate students. Which of the following statements best describes your graduate advisor's position towards international collaboration in your research project? My advisor has encouraged me to be involved, came in at about 65% or more, and that I think is great. I think that we've come, we as a community have come a long way uh, in seeing that, and I'll give you an anecdote about that in a moment. My advisor has neither encouraged me nor discouraged me was about 25%. And you know, sometimes that just means the conversation hasn't come up or hasn't come up yet. But the third one, my advisor has discouraged me. There were a few people who answered uh, in, with that choice. And the anecdote I have here is, don't give up. If, that, if this was you, I had that conversation with my PhD advisor when I was a starting graduate student. I wanted to work in the tropics. And I was strongly discouraged from doing that because field work in the tropics was difficult, doing the, you know, the uh, travel was expensive, and on and on. There were a million reasons why not to do it. And I didn't, but, uh, I, and I feel like I still had a productive graduate career, but I really am glad now that I am involved in international research. During your time as a graduate student, have you traveled abroad for special training or educational opportunities? An example I used was the Organization for Tropical Studies, an organization that is very close to my heart. Um, and it turns out that about 30% or about a third of our students have traveled abroad for some sort of a, a special training or workshop. Um, OTS is one I mentioned. The, ish, the uh, image on the lower right was sent in by a member uh, for a workshop that she had been to in Sao Paulo. Here's one of the, this is the last of the uh, uh, survey questions I'm going to show you. And this is one that I think is where I would like to see if we as a community can do better. Has membership in the BSA, this was to our international members, foreign members, has membership in the BSA helped you to become involved in international collaboration? And a full 60% of our foreign members responded negatively. So, you know, I'd like to think that one of the things we as a society could do is foster collaboration, provide people with the contacts and the information they need to find collaborators, and encourage our international members to be more uh, collaborative. Well, there's one last thing, element of international travel that I alluded to at the beginning that I want to come back to uh, before I uh, say thank you for attending, and that is the issue of cultural understanding. I think this, for all of the great things that we can be involved with in education and research and uh, training of students, the one thing that's going to stick with all of us most is the cultural experience that we have and that understanding of foreign cultures that inevitably uh, follows from travel and one-on-one -on -one interaction with uh, scientists and the public wherever you go to travel. Um, visiting the house that Joseph Rock lived in in Yunnan province when he did all of his fabulous uh, botanical and ethnographic field work uh, was a fabulous experience. Here's a little, another little pop quiz. How many of you know the tale of Robin Hood? Oh, come on, everybody knows about Robin Hood, right? How many of you know Gauchito Gill? Yeah, Sandy, great. <laughs> that little shrine on the lower left, if any of you have traveled in Argentina, you have seen shrines to Gauchito Gill. Gauchito Gill is the Robin Hood of Argentina. He was a real life character who many years ago 
became a highwayman and robbed rich travelers and dispersed what he made to the poor people in the neighborhood where he lived. He was eventually caught and hanged, but now every, literally everywhere you go in Argentina, there are these little shrines, they're all in red, they're little statues to Gauchito Gil. People leave, em, leave tokens uh, in red, half bottles of red wine, packets of cigarettes that have red uh, labeling on them, anything as long as it's red, and they believe it will bring money to them or wealth to them uh, at some other later, uh, later date. Well, cultural understanding, I think that, you know, it really is the personal connection to places and those, the history of those places. It's the establishment of long-term connections and friendships that go well past the research uh, and educational uh, activity that might have brought you together. It inevitably leaves you with an empathy for the issues that confront uh, people who live in those countries. And you will become more attuned to the international news and politics and everything else about those places where you've lived. Well, I can't quit without one more thing that is near and dear to my heart. Just as much as, Pisca as cultural understanding, uh, for those of you who know that my other passion besides plants is fly fishing, the, the piscatorial understanding is something that can come from foreign travel too. There is actually an ecological story here. I mean, they, on, the, on the left is me with some Argentine colleagues who also were into fly fishing, but on the lower right is a classic image of a Patagonian landscape. The snow-covered volcano in the distance, the willow-lined river in the foreground, the crystal clear waters in those rivers are legend, and the fabulous uh, trout that live in them bring an incredible tourist economy to Patagonia. Those willows are not native. There were no willows. Those rivers used to be more or less uh, unlined with woody plants, and they wandered across floodplains. Those willows have caused those rivers to become entrained and deeper, and a whole, I learned when I was down there, a whole molluscan community, a very diverse community of mollusks that used to live in those rivers are now threatened uh, in large part because of the willows and the impact those willows have had. Now, the willows have been fabulous for the trout, but that picture of the fish there is not a trout. That's what's called a Patagonian perch. It's a native fish in Patagonia. I've actually spent quite a few days fly fishing in Patagonia. I've caught one of them, but that's the native fish. What you catch when you go there are brown trout, such as this one from Europe, rainbow trout from Western North America, or brook trout from Eastern North America. These are all invasive species down there. And there is a small but growing consciousness among Argentines that they really should do something about this. And there is a uh, growing movement to at least establish some streams in their country where they will rid the streams of the invasive uh, salmonids. There are no salmonid fish, trout and salmon, south in the southern hemisphere, except ones that have been stocked by humans, and try to reestablish native um, ecology, native uh, habitats in those streams. I wish them well, even as I wish to go back and fish for trout again in the future. Well, what can the BSA do? You know, one of the things I think we can do better is to partner with botanical societies around the world. There are many botanical societies and countries around the world, and I think many of them look up to us, perhaps as the, you know, the Grand Botanical Society, um, and we could uh, help them by interacting with them, while helping ourselves, I think, uh, by doing the same. We can establish programs that foster collaboration or cooperation through research and education. We can expand educational opportunities internationally, both here and by taking things on the road. When I was in Brazil for an invited lecture at a Brazilian Botanical Congress, I was asked if I would teach a short course on the phylogy and systematics of Lamiales, and I was glad to do so, and it was a bunch of graduate students from Brazil, and we had a great time. Provide a conduit for information on botanists and shared interests. I think this is something that we could do at the, the Botanical Society using our uh, web presence. And promote international exchanges and training opportunities. I think there's a lot of things that we could do. Well, I want to thank you all for sending suggestions. Uh, I haven't actually had a time to look over all of the, there was a box on the survey for those of you who did or didn't fill it in. 
uh, where you could leave suggestions. And we got lots of great suggestions, and I'm hopeful that our rejuvenated International Affairs Committee will uh, take a look at all of those suggestions, and maybe we can come up with some ideas for action plans going forward. And uh, thanks to everyone who participated in the online survey and sent me photos. Good night.